Let's start in 2009 during the Copenhagen Climate Conference. Lumumba is the Sudanese ambassador to the United Nations and chair of the G77 plus China group of 132 developing nations. For the first time in the history of that group, the chair has forged an agreement between them that they will negotiate as a single bloc. The crowds waiting outside of the Bella Center in Copenhagen are seized by a concern. Will an accord be signed in the wake of Kyoto? And what will be the agreed global average temperature increase? Will it be 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, etc.? Unbeknownst to everyone else, the G20, a group of the most powerful economies on the planet, had been meeting in secret with a proposal that they had agreed upon to commit the planet and its people to an average two degree temperature increase. Then somebody leaked the text to Lumumba de Arping. And so with President Obama flying back to Washington content in the notion that the secret G20 agreement had been sealed and would soon be adopted by all the other Earth's nations, Lumumba called a press conference, you can hear a fragment of it in the piece next door, and delivered an extraordinary speech, shattering the callous facade of agreement that northern countries were preparing for their poorer neighbors. I have no doubt it will be remembered as one of the greatest and most significant political interventions in our lifetimes. So at great personal risk and sacrifice, Lumumba broke with all the protocols of diplomatic speech. The secrecies, the silent disparities, the resigned subjugations, he spoke truth to power. He described the text as climate genocide, and indeed it was. He accused the G20 of trying to colonize the sky, as indeed it was. For hitting in the scale of the global average temperature increase with the differentiated hazards and vulnerabilities of climate impact, as Lumumba said, it would have meant certain devastation in Africa. Lumumba did something else that is extremely important. He connected the language of numbers in climate negotiation to an existential calculation, a calculation of life and death. We should heed his lesson. Lumumba has been an incredible inspiration to many people. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage tonight. Good evening. Good evening. It is a real honor to stand in front of you to deliver these remarks on the tectonic challenge of climate change. As you all know, this tectonic challenge is man-made. It is a civilizational, moral, and existential challenge to humanity today, tomorrow, and for the future generations. If not addressed properly, the effects of this ecological challenge will be catastrophic to the all future generations. Be they from the west or from the south, be they white, black, yellow, or in-betweens. These remarks are thus driven by a certain consciousness and in enduring determination and a vigilant critique of anti-ecological knowledge, immaturity, and environmental disenlightenment, bent on not only denying science, but one that has marshaled successfully so far a grand strategy to render impotent any moral, social, economic, and political, or categorical transformative leadership. These remarks are against the haunting suffering of 99% of the human family. They are personal outrage against horrid violence inflicted against humanity. I represented the Global South as their chief negotiator in the trenches of Copenhagen in 2009. These remarks are my telling it like it was, a naked experience. They are remarks aimed at igniting for the interests of the future generations of the world a robust, truthful, and just discourse 
on climate change. But before I pro proceed, let me take this opportunity for a world of dedication to my family, Ulysses Henry Aping and Sonia D. Aping, and to Dom Henry Wansborough of Ample Forth. May your wings be strong. May your days be long. Safe be your journey. Each of you bears inside of you a great gift of love which, have given me, which you have given me abundantly. May it bring you light and warmth and the pleasure of giving as you have always done. Eagerly savor each day and taste of its, and the taste of its warmth, of its mouth. Never lose sight of the thrill and the joy of, of living. Son, may you grow up to be true. May you always know the truth and see the lights surrounding you. May you always be courageous, stand upright, and be strong. And may you stay forever young. Now, now, if you were born in Africa, if you went to school there, and if you were fortunate or perhaps unfortunate enough to have had a British Council sent English teacher who admired and taught you Charles Dickens, COP15 would have descended upon you the way a thousand ton of slab of concrete nightmare have done. A diluvial desolation, a hell of utter implacable global injustice and bull everywhere. You would have seen COP15 chairperson, the Honorable Prime Minister of Denmark, presiding over the UNFCCC Court of Chancery, which to paraphrase Dickens, gives to the many might, the means of, of abundantly wearing out the right and the downtrodden global poor, the means of exhausting patience, courage, and negating hope, and the means to deject, close the minds, and overthrow the brains, and break the hearts, and the means to force them to succumb and sign and a court and a pact that not only denies their humanity, but cages them to watch helplessly their entire nation, countries, and state, drowning slowly underwater, savaged by the extreme hurricanes, rains, heat waves, droughts, fires, and getting torch red, scorched yellow, and ultimately incinerated like Giacometti's men and women. And you needn't recall Eichmann. And developing countries have known, have been experiencing and witnessing the world that is to come. The new normal to arrive. Desolation. In that UNFCCC chancery, dominated by G8 plus China and India, and India's delegation, it was all pretense. And you ask, on a two degree Celsius pathway, are you serious? And they come gun slinging with their prepared answers. The perfect, the perfect is the enemy of the good you come to your senses, there's not one honorable man, woman among the UNFCCC chancery lead negotiators. Their well-rehearsed sermon was two degrees on a legally binding plate. Call it a pact. Mitigation and adaptation pledges without any commitment to emission reduction targets. No technology transfer, no finance. They repeated this sermon 
ad infinitum and sang it like a hymn. And as it turned out, it was one from a secret text known only to them. And thank God it was leaked by a rat, as the Guardian put it, years later. See, the UNFCCC have been turned into an attrition arena, a holding spectacle, purposely, purposely intended to preclude forever any attempt to reduce emissions forever, or until perhaps 2030, 2050, when the burden shifts to advance developing countries and the future generations. See, the UNFCCC COPs have been turned into this spectacle historically. And they kept giving this atrocious, vicious, malice coordinated against all demands for deep emission cuts, all negative emissions. This belligerent animosity towards developing countries in general has always come from three groups in the alliance. And this is very important. The first group is, and understandably, the quintessential Western establishment type with their apologists among the intelligentsia, particularly their jurists, economists, aided by journalists and editors. And the second group are the cleavers, the IG77 insiders and members. They are adept diplomats, sophisticated, delicate, and dexterous representative of the new economically super emergent bloc of in cahoots developing countries fossil fuel heavyweights. They apply their finance for infrastructure muscles in Asia, Africa, and Latin America to force their will. They have become the poor countries and LDCs main trading partners. And the third group are the anti-ecological environmentalists. They who love trees, forests, and organic food, but find no inconsistency between their environmentalist ideology and discrimination, racism, and colonialism. In their conceit, they believe that they can be anti-fascists and hate blacks, Asians, immigrants, and embrace discriminations against women, the working class, and the poor. And you howl, Coltrane, Messias, Simpewe, Dana, Dylan, Mali, Mesakela, where are you? Sing me a song of consolation and ascension. Send me to Gugola, the river Congo, to find dead souls in the Amazonian forest. Take me on a southern Guernica tree to hear them black bodies singing their burning flesh. But Con Copenhagen continues. The game is on, and it's the only game, the only one in town. So be, shape up. You remember Ruth's first words in her seminal work, the barrel of a gun. For I count myself an African, and there is no cause I hold dearer. Be or the only legacy you leave, Ulysses, your son, is a burden of absolute, unforgettable, unforgivable shame. The burden of having signed to the total destruction of his world, the future generation's world. And it's three o'clock. You are holding an espresso, double shot. You remember Mahmoud Darwish. You aim the sea, sky, and earth at me, but you cannot root that continent out of me. 
You cannot root my son out of me and not his generations, never. And time goes on, negotiating. It's midnight now. You are in Copenhagen. The negotiation test is over. A thousand page. And it's freezing cold. So you sing yourself. Two degrees is four degrees. Three degrees and they simply feast. Two degrees and the riches, and the riches are theirs. Two degrees. The riches are theirs. Two degrees, we are dead and they are not. Two degrees, do they care? Four degrees, and we don't live and they won't live. Do they know? Shouldn't they care? We will rise and they will rise. And we can't rise and they won't rise. Five degrees, and we are shades and they are hues. Six degrees and the world is fire. Uh, we are on fire. Our breath is gone. We are done. And the, air, and the world ain't done. Six degrees, we are all done. 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 Diplomatically. The G8, the leadership of the US, China, and India were the main culprit. Diplomatically, the USA negotiated on the basis that what of what Thasadidas wrote in the wars of Sparta and Athens, the powerful exact what they can and the weak have to comply. In such a world, it is no use that the destitute poor of the South must suffer what they must. And Africa has a peculiar position in climate change negotiations and non-industrial, as a non-industrial block of nations that has contributed near zero emissions since the heralding of the Anthropocene. The geological age of man, of man making. Since the 15th century, Portuguese endeavors in the Spice Islands to the advent of the Industrial Revolution in England, to the advent of the Industrial Revolution in England in the 18th century, Africa has had been a colony denied the dignity of being human, denied freedom and free will, justice and development. And thus to understand the predicament of an African negotiator or the African negotiators, one has to first recall and until, that until mid-1950s, Africa was not part of the global affairs, the global affairs and politics of, the multinational, of multinationalism. Until 1950s, African states were colonies, not equal member states in the global scene. A non-white, and in particular the African, was deemed subhuman. A useless, harmful stock of a Negro race whose temperament and capacity were peculiarly suited to hard labor not least because they were significantly less susceptible to physical pain than white men. And further, it was common perspective among the elites that slavery was, is, and will be needed for the regeneration of contemporary European cultures. And of course, all of this was justified and justifiable for the incomplete humanity of the state. Thus, if colonies demise, if they become freedom, then the metropolis gives herself the right to be the new robbers, the ravagers. As long as you, they cannot rule, or cannot be rulers and owners, they are men of knowledge, after all. 
In a recent article by Sir Robert Tony Watson, a distinguished and respectable scientist and a former director of the United Nations Inter IPCC, three degrees, he said the following. Three degree warming is the realistic minimum. Four degrees, Europe in permanent drought. Vast areas of China, India, and Bangladesh claimed by desert. And he goes on. The prospect of a five degree warming has prompted some of the world leading climate scientists to warn, to warn of the end of the human civilization. This elegantly phrased paragraph embodies profound truth about the challenge and calamity of the climate change in what it states and in what curiously omits. A curious omission in that important passage which forces us to ask, and what does science say about the climate change in Africa? What is the state of affairs on climate in Africa? And what bearing did it have on its position on Copenhagen and Paris Agreement? The conclusion of the force assessment report by I. PCC is that in all four regions, in all seasons, the median temperature increase lies between three degrees and four degrees Celsius, roughly 1.5 times the global mean. But as African, we knew that is the real situation, the actual reality we live. Africa is already suffering from climate change. Even with the admission of IPC itself, which is a highly respectable report, Africa's major economic sectors are vulnerable to current climate sensitivities with huge economic impact, and this vulnerability is exacerbated by existing developmental challenges such as enduring poverty, complex government, institutional dimensions, limited access to capital, including markets, infrastructure and technology, ecosystem degradation, and complex disasters and conflicts. And this brings us to some very important consideration I want to highlight here. What limit on warming does this require globally? And the answer is simple. Keeping temperature increase in Africa to below 1.5 degrees Celsius requires a global goal of less than one degrees Celsius. Keeping it below two degrees Celsius requires a global goal of less than 1.3 degrees Celsius. And we are asked to sign for two degrees. Further, what emission reduction does this require for 2050? The answer again. Limiting temperature increase requires limiting GHG concentrations and emissions. Limiting concentrations to 350 ppm, CO2 yields. Three hundred and fifty ppm yields fourteen percent chance of exceeding two degrees Celsius globally. and a considerable chance of exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius. Even temperatures and risk of these levels are arguably unacceptable to Africa. To limit concentrations to 350 ppm CO2 emissions must be limited 
to 750 gigaton CO2. And that is between 2000 and 2050. And of this amount, 330 gigatons has been used between 2000 and 2008, leaving the world with 420 gigatons. Lesser level of ambition have been misleadingly presented as consistent with keeping warming below two degrees Celsius. And we are reading the same report of the IPCC. In particular, developed countries have called for a 50% global emission reduction by 2050 from 1990 levels. This, however, entails a risk of more than 50% exceeding the two degrees Celsius. And it would not be reasonable, therefore, to characterize this as a two degree pathway. Even if you were to say it's a two degree pathway, it's not. Even an 85% global cut by 2050 entails a risk of exceeding two degrees Celsius of around 25%. We go to the question of allocation. How should the budget of this global resource then be allocated? We call for a sustainable approach. And a sustainable approach to climate change requires the air's emission budget to be set at levels that avoid dangerous climate change. An equitable approach to climate change requires the air's emissions budget to be allocated fairly. Because part of the critical issues that we face is, is, are related to issues of economic inequality. An equitable approach to climate change was thus the central issue. And Nicholas Stern stated, if, if the allocations of rise to omit any given year took a greater account both of history and of equity in stocks rather than, to f than flows, then rich countries would have rights to emit to emissions level which were less than two tons per capita. The negotiations of such rights involve substantial financial allocations at $40 per ton CO2, a total world allocation of 30 gigaton would be worth 1.1 trillion. Mind you, in 2009, a barrel of oil was priced as 110, 115 euro. We asked Annex 1 countries to take an allocation of 390 gigaton CO2 based on their population ratio, 20% of the world population. And none Annex 1 would be allocated 1,270 Gigaton. On the basis, and the basis of this is the concept of contraction and convergence. So that Annex 1 would actually use 640 gigatons, more than the fair allocation. Whether it's borrowing or 
the inevitable, the West, obviously, until there's a new way of producing energy would, would need significant allocation. Let me proceed and, and bring to your attention another issue. And that would be around the goals for mid and long term cuts for Annex 1. The scenario we assumed in 2009 was that Annex 1 countries will cut their emissions by at least half of the by at least half by 2017 and become neutral by 2050. We are in 2018. Nothing has been done. None. On this scenario, the 20% of the world's population in Annex 1 countries would still have used 640 gigaton. That's more than 60% of the total global budget and more than 40% of the remaining global budget. In a fairer world, they should have compensated or should compensate developing countries for their overuse of a trillion dollar resource providing some financial and technology transfer. But of course, that was not to be. On that issue, non-annex one countries would still need to cut emissions drastically if global emissions are to remain within the budget of the 300 and 50 ppm. But of course, as I have said, the cleavers were having none of it. We wanted developing countries, developed countries to have ambition cuts. But then Annex 1 countries have to accept less of the burden of cutting their own emissions. On technology, the number of issues that are important. The level of technology and financing required by non-annex one depends on one, the number of tons of GHG to be reduced and the cost per ton of reducing emissions. The cost in total was around 489 billion euro. That is if the average cost per ton is 60 euro, which was then huge discount because if you compare it with the, with, with, with the barrel of a, of a uh, of oil, the barrel of oil was 115. If we use the 100 euro as the base, the total financing required for the deal was 814 billion euros. I think that table gives you the full calculation. What I would say is that recent estimates put cost and damages from climate change into trillions. <laughs> 
One percent study, one recent study by Alliance Insurance suggests that the value of assets at risk from sea level rise in port facilities alone by 2050 could exceed $22 trillion. And you ask yourself, if the value at risk of inaction in a sum just for those cities is $22 trillion, and the value of action of a real solution is a trillion, why would you choose that pathway? Other issue that was contested was the issue of adaptation cost. We cannot adapt without deep emission reductions by Annex One countries, without major financing technology transfer for emissions reductions by Annex One countries, major financing of reducing actual opportunity cost. And I think even speaking about adaptation was not acceptable. The final issue that bedeviled the negotiations was the issue of the institutions. Achieving climate change resolution requires new institutions for mitigation, adaptation, technology transfer, and finance. It will require a major mobilization to help people address inevitable damage associated with current and committed war. And it will require a major effort to deploy technologies in all countries within the next five to 10 years. We are talking about 2009. Um, as I have said, that was the essence of the, of the position of the African group. That's the perspective I tried to persuade Annex One, the major polluters from, and the major polluters from the South. In our view, this was an equitable framework for global climate policy. A policy that is transformative and does not hide behind economics of the 1% who control the global economy and their ideologies. Skepticism, denialism, all the rest. Ascriptions of radicalism, derision, and verification were the answers we received from Annex One countries, particularly after they managed to convert Prime Minister Meles Zenawi to abandon the African position which was approved on the 12th African Union Summit and in the Algiers Declaration on African Common Platform to Copenhagen. In that spirit, originally Zinawi, on the 3rd of September 2009, announced that we will never accept any global deal that does not limit global warming to the minimum unavoidable level no matter what levels of compensation and assistance and assistance are promised to us. If needs be, we are prepared to walk out of any negotiations that threaten to be another rape of the continent. Those are the words of the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. Hello. Uh, and of course, the EU managed to persuade Mela Zanawi to, to abandon the agreed African Union position. On the 15th of December 2009, Zanawi issued a joint press release with President of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, I'm sure you all remember him, which declared that the African Union's position on Copenhagen was a two degrees Celsius temperature target. $10 billion in fast-track financing, $100 billion 
euros in long-term financing. We were shocked. We condemned the position as a betrayal of Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, the two degree target condemns Africa to incineration and no modern development. And when I asked President Sarkozy in the negotiation, he said to me, ask Meles. So I asked Prime Minister Meles Zinawi, and he said, and I quote, I want cash, not SDRs, special drawing rights. And later on, it transpired that he secured one billion US dollars to fight terrorism in Somalia. Fanon said, colonized man, the colonized man will manifest his aggressiveness against his own people. Full stop. Copenhagen has thus failed because of three reasons. And these three reasons will continue destroying any attempt to stop ecological degradation. The first reason, sorry, I mean two reasons. The first reason, the problem of embedded, the problem embedded in Article 2 of the United Nations Convention on Climate Change. And it states, the ultimate objective of the convention is to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at the level, at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. The truth is the climate change has already reached dangerous levels. Dangerous levels that makes its stabilization impossible. Second is the fiction of the plausibility of two degrees Celsius pathway. The two degrees Celsius pathway, the dictated perspective of the EU is a repetition of what I would deem a Eurocentric perspective that dominates its occidentalism. The basis of its scientific, moral, and economic approaches to the climate change challenge. It is fully consistent with its position and practices in world history. It is a perspective that defines what the maximum tolerable temperature on the basis of what it perceives to be acceptable levels of damage rather than avoidance of all damage. And so you ask yourself, why talk about damage? when we know we are really talking about mortality, death, social degradation, and annihilation. In view of that, the African position in the negotiations called for 45 degrees emission reduction by developed countries by 2020. That's now gone. Finance for adaptation of 150 billion immediately as SDRs, a special drawings rights from the IMF, and a global 500 billion in fast track financing, and, if, which is, and another 5% of developing countries GMP in longer term financing and transfer of technology. Our logic was very simple. Countries like United States, had then a budget of over $3.7 trillion, and they spent annually five to $600 billion in defense alone. The 2008 bailing of Wall Street, you would recall, was well above a trillion. And they are questioning or they're claiming that climate change is not financeable. 
we had to reject the signing of Copenhagen Agreement for all those reasons. And of course, with the collapse of Copenhagen, we come to the reality of the Paris Agreement, which is what we are facing now, or dealing with now. <coughs> My own perspective, the Paris Agreement, <coughs> which entered in force in 2016, had been hailed as a major diplomatic success. It is indeed a tour de force, a rhetorical one, that requires careful, critical, and sign-centric reading. The agreement reads as follows, this agreement aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty. And the question is how? And I read again, first, by holding the increase in the global average temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The strategic intent of Paris response would have been truly noble, if not for the fact that it was killed off by the fraternity of the shoots. There's nothing legally binding in Paris Agreement is all shoulds. Second, the reality and magnitude of existential crisis that we face as African is straightforward. Keeping temperature increase in Africa to below 1.5 degrees Celsius require a global response of less than one degree Celsius. Keeping the temperature below two degrees Celsius requires a global goal of less than 1.3 degrees Celsius. And we are holding as a great achievement a non-committal position of maybe 1.5 degrees Celsius. What Paris Agreement begat us thus is a median temperature increase that lies between three and four degrees Celsius in Africa. Roughly 1.5 times of the global average mean. You calculate it. It is therefore academic to talk of other purposes of the Paris Agreement. What is the use of dissecting intentions of increasing the ability to adapt to, ad to adverse impacts of climate change and foster climate resilience and low greenhouse gas emissions development in a manner that does not threaten food production? What food production? If you are in the territory of a four degrees Celsius, what poverty reduction? Africa is already buried 20 meters under poverty threshold. What sustainable development if we can't survive? But It had to be done in Paris, elegantly. COP20 had to yield and succumb to this end. This is because all the COPs ever since the very beginning have been largely a concerted effort to exclude the authority and the legitimacy of genuine science. <laughs> 
days, when they talk policy, it basically leaves science alone. This rejection of science and scientific evidence has led to the systemic marginalization and former exclusion of the African continent, the small island states, and the global poor south, and 80% of humanity from Earth's future. The Paris Agreement vision, strategic intent, remains a normative high note that was disemboweled by history. It would have been a stellar groundbreaking outcome had it been adopted in 1950s. Furthermore, even if we discount the science and the plight of the poor who constitute more than 80% of the world population, its purpose, moral aim, and ambitions lack the necessary delivery mechanism. Because by deregulating its own climate contributions, it institutionalizes the tragedy of the commons, which in the first place led to the crisis chain, and which will now further fail its strategic intent. And this is what has been provided by IPC fifth report. Climate change is already having negative impacts on Africa. It is impacting the health of land and marine-based ecosystems and the health of food security, excuse me. Of many of the regions. and most vulnerable people. This ghettoization thus, this rejection, is not only against the poor, it is also against future generations who have right. And moral obligations against the current generations. We are thus obligated morally to make sacrifices for common good of humanity. But equally, on behalf of posterity. And the truth, these obligations are not intolerable, as some economists want to convince us. And in the context of climate change, these obligations can be achieved by freeing ourselves from fossil fuel addiction by moving fully towards a renewable energy and ecologically sustainable world and economy. Our challenge is rampant individualism and not scientific or technological challenge anymore. And there is no economic and or financial difficulties here. The world has produced so much material wealth, so much knowledge, that it can today, if governments were supportive and full range of renewable technologies were deployed, that renewable energy could count for almost 80% of the world's energy supply within four decades. By the way, that was the IPCC Renewable Energy Report in 2011. It was, re it was, it was signed, it was uh, announced in Abu Dhabi. And the necessary investment in renewables would cost only 1% of the global GDP. 1% of global GDP can in four decades reduce, generate 80% of our energy needs globally. This approach could keep greenhouse gas concentrations less than 450 ppm parts per million. The level that IPC thinks, that level IPC thinks 
a safe level beyond which climate change becomes catastrophic or an irreversible. There is nothing radical in this. It is not a radical, as radical, for example, as Bill Gates' mission to Microsoft in 1980. A computer in every desk and every home. 1980. Today, every one of us has at least two, three devices. If there is a will, it can be done. And this brings me to a critical aspect of, the, of this tectonic challenge. Leadership, or lack of it. Recently, the Secretary General of the United Nations said the climate change is moving faster than we are. If we don't change course by 2020, we risk missing the point where we can avoid runaway climate change with disastrous consequences for people and all natural systems that sustain us. I would say to the Secretary General, Your Excellency, urgent action and leadership is what is needed. Because, as you have rightly said, we have the moral and economic imperatives to act as the ferocity of this summer's wildfires and heat waves shows. The world is changing before our eyes. At least the West have started to experience and see what, it, what we have been living with for the last, since 1950. If that's the case, and we agree with the Secretary General, what is critically needed is a critical review of the Paris Agreement because it has not addressed the reality of the dangerous situations we are in. We must have, to, we must have the courage to call a spade one. The world needs a real solution, and it is not Paris Agreement. It is within your powers and your mandate and your character, and I'm speaking here to the Secretary General, to act, as, to, to, act to fulfill the purposes of the United Nations in Article 1. Article 1 of the United Nations Charter says, to maintain that the purposes of the United Nations is to maintain international peace and security, and to that end to take effective collective measures for prevention. What we need, therefore, is a UN to act to stop ecological degradation. Because with that taking place, there cannot be peace. With a runaway climate challenge, there can be no peace. So let me conclude in humility. Let me say to the Prime Minister of this country, Theresa May, because yesterday she made a very important speech. referring to Honorable Diana Abbott. The billions of Diana Abbott's and their children out there whose rights to survival and their very humanity are being denied by the position of the UK in climate change, which is fundamentally cynicism and ecological denialism in practice. So lead by the example. There can be no freedom which the UK speaks of champion. There can be no freedom, no democracy, and upholding of fundamental rights if your policies deny the women of the South and their children their very right to existence and equity. And I would say the same thing to the labor right and the labor. And to Honorable Corbyn, 
There is nothing progressive and there is everything reaction in, in a Labour Party that continues to follow Ed Miliband's neoliberal pathway of two degrees Celsius that condemns Africa and small island states into drowning. There is nothing progressive in that climate neoliberal colonialism. There can be no justice at your home turf without global justice. You and McDonald and Momentum would in full class consciousness would have become another climate Trump skies. So let's stand. Let's stand up. for the rights of future generations, for the rights of Earth, for the rights of humanity. Thank you.